Good afternoon. It is the 10th of March. This is really going to be an addendum to the video I did just a couple days ago on the Border Patrol. And it's going to pertain to the Border Patrol specifically, but really to law enforcement in general, and specifically stress in law enforcement. Um, many of you uh, who are considering a career in law enforcement you know, need to be aware of one thing, and that is not only do you have to get through a psychological screening to get the job, but the job itself can be very, very psychologically demanding. Um, anybody who has been in law enforcement, I think this is federal, state, local law enforcement, knows of police officers, federal agents who have taken their own lives. Uh, that's how bad the stress can get. And some of it is, well, quite simply, here's, here's one of the reasons why. No one ever calls the police for a good reason, okay? If they call the cops, it's something bad happening. Either they're doing something bad, or they're witnessing something bad, or, you know, if it's drug enforcement, your house is being raided, nobody's happy to see you. They like to see the fire department, they like to see paramedics. Nobody wants to see law enforcement. This would apply if you're a state trooper, you're pulling people over. They don't want to see you. So, you know, that, that causes stress in and of itself. Secondly, you've got strange hours. Third, it's a very insular occupation. A lot of times the only people you can really feel you can speak with are other law enforcement officers. And then in the federal system, it's made worse by the fact that you are transferred frequently across the country. Uh, that puts a lot of strain on your family. A lot of wives say, no mas, I'm not going to do it anymore. And they, they divorce their husbands. And this is why there's such a high divorce rate. There used to be a very high alcoholism rate. They kind of rooted that out. Um, they rooted it out through aggressive use of an, uh, what we call the Office of Professional Responsibility. We would joke that the drinking age is now 57, which is the retirement age, right? Uh, but it used to be very heavy uh, drinking in, in the Drug Enforcement Administration, and I presume in other agencies as well. Literally in the 80s, you know, it was not uncommon that agents would be drunk on duty. Okay, I'm just going to come out and tell you that. Undercover agents, they would be sitting in a bar drinking and they'd be plastered, and you're out there surveilling them, and God only knows, you know, they're carrying a weapon, everybody's carrying, it's just a really bad situation. Now those days have passed. But the stress has not passed, okay, and the stress has not passed. And some things that the agencies have done, they've instituted an employee assistance program and things like that, and these things are, are very helpful. But I do want you to be aware of the fact that the stress is very real. Um, a lot of people do end up with uh, having to go to counseling, and everyone who's been in law enforcement, again, you're going to know people who've taken their own lives. What I'm going to do now is show you a video from several years back. It's actually when President Trump first came in and they talked about putting up the wall. And this pertains specifically to the Border Patrol. Okay, and uh, so take a look at this. And this would be an important consideration, again, if you're applying to the Border Patrol, because that's a very, very high stress federal law enforcement agency. Okay and um, much more so, much more stressful than the FBI, okay? The more enforcement work you do, the more stress you're going to face. That's just the way it is. So the more arrests you make, the more stress you're going to face. Um, the more stressful situations you're gonna be in, the more release of adrenaline you're going to have, and that's exhilarating in a way and in a way it's not exhilarating because you have a hard time calming down afterward or at least I did so um, take a look at this video and you know it, it shows some of the realities of the border then which was about 2017 this was made and now and um, you know it, it's something that that you need to keep in mind when you're considering law enforcement okay thank you I'm Terry Shig San Diego sector local 1613. This was what they started with. This was the first idea of putting some type of barrier up to just control the flow. This was back in the 90s. All these houses and housing developments weren't even possible back then. People didn't want to live here because 
the flow would come across and people would hide in these, their backyards. And these are our borderline a million dollar homes. We're in San Diego, California, near the San Ysidro Port of Entry, the busiest in the country with almost 60,000 people commuting across the border every day. According to the Department of Homeland Security, San Diego has been identified as one of the first places that will receive a new barrier under the Trump administration. So it sort of sounds like President Trump's idea to build just this one massive wall would actually solve a lot of issues. From our standpoint, it's the next evolution along with the understanding that you have to have the infrastructure with it. You have to have what we refer to as the green wall also to back that up. The green wall is the nearly 20,000 agents that work on the border. They are the only line of defense when no barrier exists, times dangerous job with or without a wall. We're and this is just to, uh, you know, point out this was made probably and just as President Trump was coming in and uh, the barrier was never completed. As you know, you know, all it was was a political football um, for political reasons. People on both sides of the aisle did not want it built. Um, and it hasn't been built, you know, completely uh, anywhere. As far as I know, I mean, there's still lots of border that is not uh, at all protected. And uh, at, at one time, you know, again, I think going back four years, you would have had a great deal of political support in that job. And that would at least help dealing with stress somewhat. Again, I'm not trying to be political at all, but what I am saying is that um, the stress of this job you know, without political support goes way up. It goes way up. And uh, because you feel that if you do something, um, you're going to be thrown to the wolves. And uh, that's something to keep in mind, you know, in uh, applying for this. Hearing the actual noise from the Correct. highway in Mexico, which right. is just. It's just on the other right side there. of the fencing, yeah. We're very close to Tijuana. There were times when in this area you had to have an armored vehicle because of the rocks and the bottles and the gunshots that were coming from the south. But when did that start to get better? When did that start to change? Once we started putting down the fencing. In the shadow of the wall is another dark reality of being an agent here. It's something Terry has single-handedly made his mission to bring to light. We're a little ways away from the border, so why did you want to bring us here? Well, I wanted to bring you here just to kind of accentuate a, an issue that we have within law enforcement, especially with Border Patrol agents. This particular location was the location where one of our agents did take his own life. Border Patrol agents have the highest suicide rate of any law enforcement official. Today, it's nearly double the national average, 20 in 100,000. It's a statistic that fellow agent Chris Harris knows all too well. Bobby had been injured in the line of duty, as I had. We both were suffering a lot of pain. And I've tended to see this now with, with agents who have been traumatic injuries. And when you have that constant pain that you think might last forever. So Bobby went to work one day, um, was working midnight shift, drove to work in his uniform, then drove his personal vehicle down here, parked it, and shot and killed himself. Bobby's death in 2010, along with two more back-to-back -back in Terry's sector, struck a nerve. Terry looked for support and training within the agency, but he couldn't find a dedicated resource beyond training at the academy level and a yearly refresher. As a licensed therapist and with the support of the Border Patrol Union, he created his own. In the presentation, I discussed the fact that I went through a divorce, my father died, and I didn't really tell anybody about it. I really? just kind of dealt with it on my own. This is something that's interesting. You know, an officer has the initiative to do this on his own. He's a therapist, but that, that also goes to show you uh, the degree of concern that the political elites have for these agencies. Okay, uh, The military, they have the VA system, which is set up, and you know, for better or worse. Um, but again, 
you know, there, there isn't a lot of support for uh, those who suffer from uh, chronic pain or mental health issues related to job-related stress, and uh, particularly when you get into an agency such as this one, which is, uh, you know, suddenly was held in fairly high regard and now is, you know, not held anywhere near in as high regard and, you know, basically the president, I think, can't be bothered to even uh, acknowledge that, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people coming across right now. He, he has no clue what to do. And, you know, get, these poor guys are left holding the bag. So it, it's something to, uh, to consider for sure. It took me going through counseling to go, okay, this is how you deal with it in a, a healthy way. So how many times have you given this presentation? 50, 60 times. It sounds like a lot, but is that enough? No, it's nowhere near enough in my mind. This issue has made its way to the agency. Customs and Border Protection recently created the National Resiliency Task Force, which, quote, addresses issues critical to the workforce to include suicide prevention. If every agent in Border Patrol had access to this training, do you think that it would help save lives? Yes, I, I do. The best response that I get is the phone call from somebody that I've never met before that said, hey, my friend told me that I should call you, I'm having a tough time. That's the most rewarding part for me.